I call the Senate Housing and Homelessness Prevention Committee to order. Uh, today we are hearing three bills. The first bill will be laying over, the second will be sending to state and local government, and the third will be sent to capital investment. Uh, with that, the first item our, on our agenda is Senator Seeberger's bill, Senate File 3625. Welcome to the committee, Senator Seeberger. Please introduce yourself for the record and pre present your bill. Good afternoon, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Senator Judy Seeberger here on Senate File 3625, uh, dealing with uh, rent increases for our senior citizens. Last year, seniors in Minnesota rallied the Capitol to bring awareness to the exploitation they face from big housing developers. Over the last year, I have met with countless constituents and Minnesota seniors who feared eviction due to rent increases. Some seniors' rent went up by 12% in the last year. Minnesota seniors, we heard you, and we are paying attention. This bill, in response to those concerns, would safeguard vulnerable seniors residing in low-income rental projects by implementing measures to control rent increases. Seniors are often reliant on fixed incomes and face the risk of being priced out of their homes due to escalating housing costs. By targeting projects specifically tailored to seniors and those supported by low-income housing tax credits, we ensure that those most in need of affordable housing are prioritized. This legislation establishes an annual limit on rent increases calculated based on the preceding year's percentage increase in Social Security or Supplemental Security Income benefits, minus 1% or 0%, whichever is higher. And this is a change from the current status, which is uh, based on median income for a particular area. Large developers are operating on a tilted playing field, and it's our job to step in, level that playing field for Minnesota seniors, and protect them from exploitation. By maintaining affordable rents, we uphold the dignity and well-being of seniors, because seniors should be enjoying their retirement, not worrying about being evicted. They shouldn't have to spend their golden years working because of lucrative rent increases. And with your permission, Madam Chair, I do have three testifiers lined up and ready to go. Thank you very much, Senator Seeberger. Uh, first on the list, I have Janice Brocky, who I believe is joining us online. Ms. Brocky? Are you, can you see me? There we go. Thank you very much. Please introduce yourself for the committee and uh, present your testimony. Hello, and thank you, Chair Port, Vice Chair Bolden, and members of the committee. My name is Janice Brocky. I have been a tenant in a 55 plus affordable housing community in St. Anthony Village for two years. I want to thank Senators Seeberger, Abler, Mitchell, Gustafson, and Hoffman for authoring Senate File 3625. When my husband and I moved into our apartment two years ago, we thought it would be our forever home. But the harsh reality is that it won't be. Rents have increased so much in the last two years that as of today, neither of us on a single income earns the minimum income required with our social security and pension for a single occupancy apartment in our building. So should anything happen to either of us, the survivor will have to leave the community we have called home. We hear this story every day from our friends and our neighbors as they desperately look at the future. In the past six years, rent in our building has increased 33% for a one bedroom apartment. During the same period, seniors saw only a 23% increase in their COLA. We have no place to go. We make too much for program assistance, but not enough to keep on living in affordable housing. Just think about that for a second. I don't make enough to live in affordable housing. Every day we listen to the stories of our neighbors of what they are giving up to make sure they can pay the rent. They are giving up their cars, medical care, medications, food, internet services, and more. Our residents depend on food from three different food shelves to make ends meet. 
What does this say about us and our values as Minnesotans? Seniors should be allowed to age gracefully and with dignity in the home of their choice, a home that is safe and meets the physical challenges of aging. Our rent increases are making that impossible. As a senior tenant, and for all the low-income senior tenants, as well as low-income families across the state, we urge you desperately to vote yes on Senate File 3625. Thank you for listening to my testimony. Thank you, Ms. Brackey. Uh, next on the list, I have Sandy Helley. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and provide your testimony. My name is Sandy Helley. Thank you, Chair Port, Vice Chair Bolden, and members of the committee. I'm, again, my name is Sandy Helley. I live in what I was told is an affordable housing building. I moved here in April 2022. I am co-chair of our building's resident action committee and a representative of the broader Minnesota Tenants Coalition made up of 17 organized affordable housing properties. I want to thank Senator Schieberger for championing State File 3625. Each of us has a story to tell. Many of our stories include major medical health issues. There is so much fear and anxiety among all of us when it comes time to renew our leases. We wonder, is this going to be the time when we can no longer afford affordable housing? We don't want to leave. This is now where our family is. Just last week, I had three different residents come up to me saying that they couldn't make the rent for the next month. How does this happen? I happen to know that all three of these people had major medical expenses recently. As hard as they tried, they couldn't stretch their dollars. I truly wanted to cry for them. I suggested that two of them go to the city or the county for help. They're still waiting. I brought the third person to our property manager and she assisted the resident in getting into a smaller, less expensive apartment. Although this remedy is not always available for everybody who needs it. Each year when your rent increase goes up more than your income increase, it becomes more and more unsustainable. We're asking you to support us and help us stay in our homes with a stable and predictable rent increase each year. It's time to listen to those Minnesotans who are on a fixed and low income. You have the ability and the resources to help us. Hear our voices. Listen to what we are saying. On behalf of all the tenants in our building, we urge you to vote yes on SF 3625. Thank you for listening to my testimony. Thank you, Ms. Helley. Uh, next, I have Cedia Omar. Welcome back to the committee, Ms. Omar. Please introduce yourself for the record and provide your testimony. Thank you. My name is Cedia Omar. Thank you, Chair Port, Vice uh, Chair Bolden, and Senate Committee. My name is Sadia Omar Anu, American Development Center, a nonprofit organization that works with East African communities and a part of EIP members. I understand the critical ro role housing plays in shaping one's destiny. My childhood memories of my mom making flatbread in Mogadishu, Somalia, are still felt with the uncertainty of fleeing our home. At the tender age of five, I faced homelessness for the first time, not comprehending the reasons behind leaving every, everything familiar behind. Arriving in a new country, we face homelessness again, struggling to find place. My parents worked tirelessly to keep our family safe. As a grade school child, my education was put on hold, highlighting the profound impact of unstable housing on child's development. In America, I faced homelessness once, I, once more. A lack of space forced me to find my own place, and with determination, I secured a job and joined a waiting list for low-income housing. Stability entered my life with, with this 
housing opportunity mar uh, marking a turning point with a, 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 so a secure place to live. I was finally able to pursue higher education. I enrolled in college and successfully completed my degree. And I was the first graduate from college in my family, breaking the cycle of instability that had marked my early years. My journey, and, uh, my journey underscores the transform transformative power of housing. Beyond providing shelter, it opens doors to education, opportunities, and a brighter future. As we advocate for affordable housing, let us remember the profound impact it can have on individuals and families shaping lives for the better life. While Senate File 32, uh, 30, 3625 has good intentions to protect its fixed income senior tenants, it must also address the disparities of multi-generational low-income housing. And I hope you vote yesterday. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Omar. Uh, finally, I have Cecil Smith. Mr. Smith, please introduce yourself for the record and provide your testimony. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Cecil Smith. I'm President and CEO of the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association, known as MHA. MHA is an industry nonprofit representing 2,200 members with over 300,000 rental units in the state. I'm here to respectfully raise MHA's opposition to Senate File 3625. Housing economists are only occasionally united in their opinion, but when it comes to rent control, they are. The vast majority of economists, including Paul Krugman, raise red flags about rent control for one simple reason. It doesn't work. The unintended consequences outweigh the benefits. Today, the country looks to St. Paul as an example of the negative consequences of rent control. While this proposal is narrowly focused to a specific program, it will mean broader avoidance and divestment. Enacting this bill will ensure Minnesota does not have the supply of senior affordable housing to meet the needs as Minnesota's baby boomers look to downsize into senior rental housing. This proposed regulatory regime will send development capital to other opportunities where their project will be viable. Under this proposal, the operating math for senior LIHTC does not work. The projects will not be viable. Last year, the legislature provided funds for nonprofit housing providers experiencing financial distress. This proposal will only exacerbate the financial challenges those same operators face. If the goal is to create and preserve housing affordability for low and middle income seniors, the state should look to other options, such as supplemental rental assistance. We're also concerned that this bill is retroactive and would interfere with existing funding agreements. Furthermore, retroactively layering a rent control policy would incentivize flipping a property at the end of the required affordability covenant. Given the demographics of our state, Minnesota needs substantially more senior affordable housing in the coming years. This bill undermines that goal. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, members, questions? Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Seberger, for the opportunity to have this important conversation. It is absolutely heartbreaking. Those on fixed incomes, those who are unable to afford the continued rise in the cost of housing, it is absolutely heartbreaking. I continue to receive communications from across the state of those that are in positions similar to the, the testifiers but not just renters, also those that are our homeowners that are having their costs of taxes and the burden of, of all the costs that go into home ownership continue to rise and it's crushing their budgets. But I do have certainly concerns with this and I appreciate the conversation and, and our attempts to try to do something, but I, I'm deeply concerned about, about this legislation. So I have a handful of questions here. Uh, the first is I see on line 1.8 it's a, it, it reads, this subdivision applies to any project. And then it gives two criteria. It's essentially uh, 55 plus communities and then those that have been uh, part of uh, the low income housing tax credit. So when it comes to the definition of project though, is let's just say it's a uh, uh, housing of 20 units. Is are all 20 units in scope or is it uh, could there be scenarios where 
the low income tax credit only applies to maybe four of those 20. And so if you could clarify, what is the definition of project in this case? Senator Seeberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Lucero. I think the important thing to remember here is that uh, what this bill seeks to do is change how low-income rents are calculated and the funding for low-income rents are calculated. We're moving from an area media, median income factor to um, uh, looking at Social Security benefits, which really better represents the income that our seniors receive. Now, I agree, I, I agree with our testifiers that more needs to be done, and I think more should be done. But this particular bill is, is meant to address an immediate need um, of our seniors being predatorily priced out of their homes. I hope that answers your question. Senator Lucero. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Seberger, that didn't address my question whatsoever. My question is I'm trying to understand the scope of the units that would be subjected to the rent control. So in a 20-unit complex, for example, uh, not being familiar with this type of tax credit, does, would all 20 units be in scope if it's the entire project, or could a project, as you have it defined in your bill, be just a subset? So in a 20-unit complex scenario, are there cases out there where maybe only four or some subset less than the total have the low-income tax credit applied to them, and therefore only those units not the whole building, but just those units would be the ones that are subjected to the rent control. Senator Seberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Again, this goes to how we um, calculate the formula with regard to the rent control, and it goes building by building. So if something is, if your 20-unit building now has four units that are rent controlled based on the area median income, now this changes it so that the rent control is calculated based on the Social Security or supplemental Social Security. In terms of each particular building, which units are going to be subject to rent control, that's on a per building basis. Um, so what we're looking at here is how those rent control factors are calculated, not with regard to changing which units are rent controlled units within any particular building. Senator Lucero. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I do have uh, several more questions. Let me, let me rephrase the question. I'm still not getting it. So in a building of 20 units, is there a scenario where not all 20 units would be subjected to the rent control. If I'm a housing provider that owns a 20 unit building, how do I determine which of those 20 units, all of them or only some of them, would be subjected to the provisions of this bill if it were to become law? Uh, Senator Seberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Lucero, this particular bill does not address which units and which proportion of units in any particular housing pro, uh, uh, structure are subject to rent control provisions. This merely determines how that rent control number is calculated. So this bill doesn't address your particular question. Senator Lucero. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. So. Uh, I'll, I'll stop with that particular question, but what I just heard, uh, Madam Chair, the bill author say, is the bill is some kind of a formula to determine the amount of rent control, but the bill doesn't address who it applies to. That's what I just heard as a response, and I, that doesn't make any sense. Well, Senator Lucero, if I can interrupt for a moment, um, that's how it currently exists in law. This all, there is already a rent restriction on senior housing that gets low income tax credits. It is based on AMI, area media income. This bill would change it to be based on COLA instead. Doesn't change how, which of those buildings are in that program. It just changes that measurement, correct? Uh, Senator Seberger? Madam Chair, yes, that's correct. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair. That was the answer I was looking for. Thank you, Madam Chair, for answering that. So move on to the next question. When it comes to the, uh, the COLA increase that's applied, one of the concerns that I have is if the costs of that housing, from the housing provider's perspective, increases at a larger percentage than the COLA, there's going to be an imbalance. And so property taxes have increased. I'm sure all Minnesotans have experienced that. 
the cost of insurance, hazard insurance, has skyrocketed across the board for different types of property. The maintenance costs, both supplies and labor, have gone up. And so we could be in a situation under this bill where if we're limiting how much the rent can be increased, but the cost increases greater, that's going to dissuade people from building such projects, which will have a direct adverse impact to the number of units we have in Minnesota. That is the opposite of what we need to be doing, which is to increase the number of units. And I would just point to the recent history in St. Paul. So St. Paul and access rent control. And what happens? Projects that were a work in progress had immediate uh, either halting or severe limitations put on them. Those that had not yet broken ground were immediately stopped in the process because the rent control acts as an adverse uh, reason to build more units. So my second question then, Madam Chair, to the bill author, do you have a concern that if the costs of the building rise faster than what your bill would allow for rent increase, that that would dissuade people from new construction or it might even cause those units that are currently available to become unavailable? Senator Seeberger. Madam Chair, Senate Lu Senator Lucero, no. Senator Drahan. I have one oh. more. Senator Lucero. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So the follow-up to that then is why do you not believe that, that would be the case and why do you think this would be different than what happened in St. Paul when they enacted rent control? Senator Seeberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Lucero, uh, what I'm hearing is, is that our seniors are put at a disadvantage in that costs are vastly out, per, outpacing their cost of living increases that they receive through Social Security. So. Uh, my response to that is we need to increase the COLAs for Social Security. We need to do better by our seniors. We need to make housing more affordable. Um, and to the extent that that means uh, uh, preventing predatory pricing and uh, diminishing the margin of profit for uh, builders and uh, housing companies, um, I'll take saving our seniors and preventing house, uh, homelessness on the part of seniors over um, a small diminution of profits for our housing companies and construction companies. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just to follow up to that, no question, just a comment. What if there is no profit? That's the point I'm trying to get at, and that's what you didn't answer, unfortunately, because we have recent history, not distant past, but the recent history in St. Paul where rent control was enacted and the cost to build, the cost to maintain, exceeded the cost of the rent that could, could go up. And so there was no profit. You, you just, in your answer, said, we need to put seniors over profit. But what if there is no profit? In these last several years, we saw the cost of, or we saw in the rate of inflation at nine plus percent for several years or several quarters in a row. And if you're throttling this to 3%, 4%, but inflation's at 9%, then there is no profit. And I'm concerned of just the evasive answers to recent history that demonstrate rent control stops and actually results in more homelessness and more hardship. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for having a hearing on this bill. Uh, great topic. You know, it, it, there is a problem with senior housing, and, and we've been screaming it for eight years, and, and that's why one of the things we did was we changed the use of bonding to include senior housing, um, but very disappointed in the number of units that were created. So we have a supply and demand problem, across the board in housing. And, and why I pushed so hard for that senior housing and the bonding was we have an aging population. So what's gonna happen? We're gonna have a shortage of, a, of uh, senior housing. But the problem's bigger than just the rentals. 
Um, I, I would say once a month I hear from someone that is having to relocate out of their home that they own that they can't afford to stay in it because taxes got too high, too expensive to stay there. So it's a broader problem than just the rental. But I, I applaud you for trying to work on that. Um, you know, I, I think Senator Lucero was on to something with the St. Paul example. And it, it was just reported here in the last month, and I don't know if you saw that or not, that uh, St. Paul cut a deal with one of the uh, housing providers if they would build a new project in St. Paul. And they had to guarantee them to go forward with the project. Um, that rent control wouldn't affect them. So we're picking winners and losers when we should be begging anybody and everybody to build more senior housing. And I apologize for being late, Chair. Uh, was at another meeting. I don't know if I missed a presenter or not, but did we have anybody, maybe a nonprofit, that builds senior housing testify? Is there anybody that would, in the audience that does that space? I'm not real familiar with them. Um, no? We did not, no. Okay. I don't know if there's anybody in the audience that would like to comment on that. Um, but, you know, in market rate environment, I, I can speak to that. I'm pretty close to that. Um, Senator, Senator Lucero, excuse me, sorry, it's your yellow coat that's throwing me off today. Um, <laughs> you know, was onto something about the cost of insurance. I, I just had a client that um, tried to get insurance for a new building that they just bought. And um, two weeks before they were going to close, they got a quote on insurance. The day they were going to close on the building, it had doubled. And they, they tried four different commercial insurance offices, and all of them told them the same thing, that no one wants to write in commercial insurance in Minnesota. Us and Florida are the two worst states. Doubled. This is a small building. It was an eightplex. It went from $5,600 to eleven. dollars or excuse me, 11,200 in two weeks. In Lucero's example, what, what is the owner to do? And, and those are, those smaller ones are usually the ones that are more flexible with people on, um, kind of on the line of being able to afford a unit or not. And under this provision, I, you know, I, I think they wouldn't have any seniors live in their units. And that's really sad because we need everybody to step up and, and have more units. Um, you know, I, I think one of the testifiers um, mentioned all the economists. And, and I don't know how much research you did on rent control. Um, but this has been studied around the world and tried everywhere. And it hasn't worked anywhere. What... I guess, Senator Seberger, what do you think is different in St. Paul or in Minneapolis or anywhere in the state that hasn't been tried elsewhere in the world to make rent control work? Senator Seberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Draham. And you bring up a lot of really important points. And I agree that we need more affordable housing and more deeply affordable housing and more senior housing. Um, and we need to um, address the rising costs that everybody's facing. Um, and from my perspective, I'm here to talk on behalf of seniors. And I'm here to talk on behalf of rent control practices that we already have. So these are rent control pro pro uh, processes that we already have. This bill isn't meant to get rid of rent control. We can have the discussion with regard to rent control. Um, but what we're looking at is rent control that already exists and changing the way we calculate it so that it more accurately takes into consideration the income, the realistic income of our seniors so that they're not priced out of their homes. We heard a testifier say that she made too much money 
with her husband's pension and her social security to qualify for low income house or low income rental assistance, but not enough money to afford their affordable senior housing that they're in. They're caught in this gap. And while I agree with everything you said, what can't wait is our seniors. And what I will not stand by and watch is our seniors being priced out of apartments, being made homeless tomorrow. Tomorrow's March 1st, right? Being turned out on the street because they can't make rent. That's what this bill is meant to address. What does this do? I mean, we can have the discussion about rent control, but rent control already exists. And this is meant to address the predatory rent increases that are pricing our seniors out of our home, that are making our seniors one of the fastest growing homeless populations in the state. And it's keeping seniors in their home. This is an immediate fix that's needed now. I agree. We need to address housing in all its forms. And we need to address uh, uh, COLAs that our seniors currently do not experience and should it get more of. And if it were up to me, they wouldn't pay any property tax and they wouldn't pay tax on any of their social security. Those are different discussions. This is to keep our seniors in their homes so they're not turned out in the street tomorrow on March 1st. Senator Drahan. Thank you. Yeah, we, we had the opportunity to fix the social security problem last year, but we, we passed on that. Uh, you know, a lot of us here did vote for it multiple times uh, to eliminate the social security tax. But um, that's not what we're discussing today. Do we have uh, any idea how many units this would affect? Senator Seberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. No. Would uh, nonpartisan staff have any idea on how many units? I can have research look into it and get back to the committee. Yeah, we're laying this over, correct? Correct. So I, I think the, it would be nice to know of how many units um, that it would affect. And, and I think Senator Lucero also brought up another good point about, you know, I, I think if you had a building that wasn't 100% senior housing and you had maybe just like the first floor senior housing, um, you know, what's to stop the operator from switching units every year uh, to what units are senior housing if they're not the whole building isn't senior housing. Um, so if this is the direction you want to go, I think that there's some language that needs to be tightened up. I think it's a terrible idea, um, but I don't know if it works the way it's drafted. Um, well, I will just say, you know, happy to uh, continue working with the author and members of the committee. Um, like this already exists in law. There are low income tax credit senior housing that exists. It simply changes the formula for how that amount of rent increase is allowed. Um, so I'm certain that there is more in statute that defines how they guarantee those apartments are senior housing, how they qualify for the LIHTC programs. Um, but we can certainly get into that. Um, we will be laying this over. Um, Senator Bolden. So can I oh, Senator respond Drahan. to that? Thank you. I think it's important that if we're going to pass a bill, we should know how many people it affects and is this really going to have the outcome. And, and I think we have to look at the numbers. So I, I will I, certainly get that okay. from the agency. Okay, thank you. Yep. Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Seberger, for bringing this bill. Um, I appreciate the discussion that we're having. This is a really important issue. Uh, and just to clarify, my understanding of the bill that it's targeted specifically to fixed income units where developers have accepted subsidies um, and affordability agreements. So when AMI goes up, uh, like we have seen in the past, big developers uh, you know, increase the rent some 12%. The um, social security income for our seniors does not increase at that same rate, and so you know what that means is that those seniors and other vulnerable populations get left behind. And so I appreciate you bringing this bill to try to rectify that issue. Um, I had a conversation in my office a couple of weeks ago with a group of seniors, and this issue came up because it was real for them. This was a group of folks who were in their 70s and 80s. And they were telling me that they, all of them, were working, had jobs, some, some of them full-time jobs. They were in their 80s. I don't know how we think that that's acceptable. It's not. Um, 
And if that's not the case, then you know, folks are risking homelessness and food insecurity and uh, delaying or um, abstaining from health care because all of their money is going towards rent. And in some cases, still, that's even not enough. And so I um, appreciate you taking on this issue. Um, and I look forward to supporting this bill. Thank you. Senator Housley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Senator Drahan, we didn't even get to talk before committee, but that was one of my questions, too, is how many units are there in low-income senior housing uh, tax credits? Um, I would like to get that information also. Um, and Senator Lucero brought up um, an unpopular word around this place, and that was profit. Um, and Senator Seberger, thank you, because this is a, a a good topic, and I'm glad we're having the discussion because I've met with many seniors um, also uh, about this issue. I just don't know if this is exactly the bill that could fix it. Um, I think there might be some some other options out there. But when Senator Lucero brought up um, profit, and it is tough to talk about it around here, but I'm, I'm afraid that if there are developers that just aren't going to get into this anymore, that's going to make fewer and fewer units which is going to make the ones that are out there cost even more. So that, I mean, is something to think about because no one's going to get into it unless they are going to be able to profit at least a little. Um, but my other worry is since a landlord's going to be limited to how much they can increase the rent each year, wouldn't we expect the landlord then to increase the rent at the maximum amount each year under the uh, law that's allowed? Senator Seeberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Housley. Um, it's impossible for me to speculate on what a landlord may or may not do. Um, my focus right now is keeping on keeping these units affordable for seniors. So I would presume and probably all of us would assume that to the extent the landlord has to increase the rent, they'll increase it to whatever they, they need to. Um, Senator thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Seberger. Um, I'm also worried that the landlord may not renew the, the lease with the tenant because he has the option on the horizon to remove that tenant and raise the, uh, raise the rent for the next tenant. Um, under this bill, is a landlord allowed to reset the rent for a restricted unit each time the tenant vacates the unit? Uh, in other words, a, a vacancy decontrolled, is that, is that allowed? Senator Seberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Housley, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm sure somebody would be able to, to find that out. Um, it, it's important to stress that this just, this just changes the mechanism by which we calculate the rent for those already participating in the rent control uh, program. Senator Housley? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, does anybody know that answer? I mean, they would need to follow the same LIHTC rules that they currently have to follow, the same, or they would lose their tax credits. So I don't, okay. they're not allowed to go higher than the current AMI increase and keep their tax credits. Mm -hmm. So that would continue. Thank you. Um, I just have one more here on my list. Um, so I don't know if, if um, Senator Seberger, if you think that St. Paul's rent control or ordinance has been a success or not, but I'm thinking maybe you might think that was, that was a success, but I'm just wondering in your bill, um, is there any, there's not an option for any exemption to uh, rent control. Um, new construction is exempted in the St. Paul bill, and um, landlords also have the option to re uh, request an exemption to rent control. Is, were, are you open to maybe an amendment towards that, or is there a reason that it wasn't included? Senator Seberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Housley, certainly I think the discussions need to continue because we have a housing crisis for not only our seniors, but our immigrant population, other low-income population, the middle class. Um, I, mean, I mean, 
you know what home prices are, are, are at. Um, young people coming out on the market. I mean, we have a housing crisis across the board. This bill only deals with seniors. It doesn't deal with our immigrant population who are already on rent control. It doesn't deal with our low-income folks who are on rent control. Um, so in that regard, this, distinct, this is distinguishable from other rent control projects that have gone forward. We're focusing on a, on a subset of folks um, our seniors who, you know, if I, could, if I could come up with bill language that could, you know, improve the housing situation for everyone, you know, I already would have done that. Here we're focusing on one immediate problem that has to do with our seniors and those that are at risk of, of losing their housing due to predatory rent increases. Senator Housley. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Seberger, and thank you for bringing this discussion. It is, it is really, really an important topic and a priority for a lot of us around this table, um, and I'm hoping that we can come up with that language that, that will work for everybody and we can get this resolved and get these seniors some relief. So thank you. Senator Seberger, um, I want to thank you for bringing this bill uh, and your work to get bipartisan authors on it um, because I think Affordable senior housing is something that touches all of our communities and crosses party lines, uh, and I appreciate your continued uh, focus on making sure that our seniors have safe and affordable places to live. I just want to make a few comments. Um, one, you're absolutely right, this problem is bigger, and this is one piece of it, but it's a piece that can't wait. Um, last year we saw area median income in a lot of places go up 12 or 13 percent and rents in those subsidized places go up the same amount. And COLA for seniors went up 8%, I think. So that's a 4% gap um, that I don't know how on a fixed income you're supposed to bridge that gap. Um, I would also, you know, there's, there's conversation about maybe this will make developers not come in and build senior housing. If our seniors can't stay in the housing that we have, then the system isn't working. Um, so I appreciate uh, the, the idea that this is one of the things that we can do. I continu continue to agree with Senator Dreheim that like, we need more, we need more supply. Um, and, and what we're talking about here is developers who are choosing to get into affordable senior housing, tax credit, they know the rules of the program, they know the requirements, they know that there are regulations on how much they can raise the rent. These are not new programs. Uh, it just simply changes one part of the formula to make it more accurately represent how seniors' income changes because it's different than area median income. Uh, they don't, COLA doesn't go up at the same rate, rates, rate, uh, wages go up. So I, I really appreciate the sort of very thoughtful, narrow nature of this bill. Um, I think we can debate broader rent control um, forever, but we do know that really structured, specific um, rent control tied to subsidized housing has been in place for a long time and that it does work. Um, I appreciate your really uh, focused bill that, that looks at adjusting that one thing that can help seniors. So thank you very much. Uh, and with that, members, this bill is laid over. I will now hand over chairmanship to uh, my very able vice chair. Senator Port, please proceed as you are ready. Thank you, Chair Bolden. Uh, members, I would like to present Senate File 4254, and I do have an author's amendment, the A1. Uh, very good, Senator Port moves the A1 amendment. Uh, as an author's amendment, uh, we will move that. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Senator Port, to your bill as amended. Thank you very much, Senator Bolden. Uh, members, 
I uh, want to talk briefly about public housing and really the important impact that it has on our communities. Um, public housing is essential in preventing homelessness and creating housing stability in our state. And this bill is about making sure that we have funding to preserve our public housing stock. Minnesota has a nearly $200 million capital repair backlog and opening the door to federal resources will help keep public housing in our state dignified, stable, and desirable. We're currently missing out on federal funding for public housing in Minnesota as a result of restrictions. This clarifying fix is intended to allow public housing authorities to form the necessary public corporations to access critical federal resources through RAD and other programs while maintaining the sole public ownership required by the state constitution. We are really asking um, all stakeholders, including MMB and uh, the, the public housing advocates uh, across the state to come together to find a solution to fix this problem. The lack of public housing funding has serious health and safety impacts for residents, including mold, infestation, and other serious repairs. Most of our public housing uh, residents are either children or seniors with disabilities. So these are very vulnerable populations and these kinds of repairs are not just, you know, they need new paint on the walls. They can be potentially very serious health concerns uh, that we need to have that money invested. And to be clear, I'm not asking for state money to be invested. I'm asking for a clarifying fix in the language to unlock federal dollars that exist exactly for this purpose. Um, this bill simply modernizes bonding standards to reflect the reality of federal funding opportunities. Public ownership is a critical principle for bonding. However, if the sole member of an LLC is a public housing agency, then that condition should be met in order to secure federal funding for public housing. Members, my hope for this bill is to really bring everyone to the table to find a way to bring federal money to Minnesota. This language represents one idea for uh, for options to fix this language, but I'm hoping that it brings everyone to the table before the next hearing to find a solution that works for Minnesota. Thank you, Senator Port. Uh, we will move to testifiers. Uh, Melissa Taphorn, uh, please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, I'm Melissa Taphorn. I'm the Executive Director of the Washington County Community Development Agency or CDA, and I'm also the legislative chair for Minnesota NARA, which is the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials. Uh, thank you, Chair Port, uh, Vice Chair Bolden, Ranking Minority Member Lucero, and committee members uh, for consideration of Senate File 4254. Uh, you've heard from us repeatedly about the shortfall of federal funds for public housing, and you have responded repeatedly uh, with general obligation bonds. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, housing authorities continue to look for other means to not only address that capital backlog, as, um, but also to keep up uh, the maintenance on our public housing. HUD has even provided us with some uh, additional paths to do that, and it, they term it repositioning. Uh, these repositioning paths allow housing authorities to bring in other federal funds as well as borrow, which we can't do on public housing right now, in, uh, that are necessary to address the property's capital assets or capital needs. A couple of these paths require the housing authority to create a separate uh, ownership entity while still in the housing authority's control. However, we're unable to do that if we have a POP loan, the publicly owned housing program uh, that the GEO bonds fund, uh, or if we intend to apply for one because that new entity is not considered a public entity according to Minnesota Management and Budget, or MMB. This bill attempts to cure that. It is important to note that it does not expand the number of properties uh, that it would be applied to, nor does it circumvent the public purpose or the public ownership eligibility of general obligation bonds. My colleagues from Minneapolis and Duluth will share how this impacts their portfolio. And while you listen to their stories, I want to, you to keep in mind that they are one of the lar or they are two of the larger housing authorities in Minnesota and have a greater number of public housing units than most of our housing authorities. The vast majority of Minnesota's housing authorities have one public housing building, maybe 50 units. 
Uh, they do not have in-house counsel to advise them on how to go through this process, nor do they um, have the ability to negotiate case by case with MMB. For my housing authority, we took out a POP loan of $271,000 about 10 years ago against our one and only public housing building, which is 40 units, all one bedrooms for seniors. Uh, we would like to reposition those units to housing choice voucher platform, where the amount HUD pays us um, has the potential to go from $280 per unit per month to $1,020 per month. That alone would give us $355,000 just in one year to reinvest back into our property. Right now, we have to wait until 2051 uh, when those POP loan restrictions expire to even consider repositioning. We look forward to working with you and to find a clear and transparent process to ensure the long-term solution for our public housing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Taphorn. Next, we'll hear from Drew Halunen. Please introduce yourself and say your name correctly and proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair Port, Vice Chair Bolden, members of this committee, and it's Hullinan. It's from up north on the range. It's Finn. Everyone gets it wrong. Um, but anyways, uh, my name is Drew Hullinan. I'm from the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority. Um, thank you for having me here today. Currently, MPHA maintains about 700 deeply affordable family homes um, scattered across the city of Minneapolis in almost every neighborhood. For years, these homes existed on the agency's Section 9 public housing portfolio. Um, however, during that time, they amassed a massive capital backlog due to decades of federal disinvestment. So in an effort to save these homes in 2020, MPHA converted them from the Section 9 public housing portfolio over to the Section 8 uh, housing choice voucher portfolio. And by doing that, um, we were able to more than double the federal subsidy we were getting for operating the same homes. Um, and in fact, that conversion was guided by HUD. Um, so it led us to utilize a uh, wholly controlled nonprofit community housing resources, or CHR, um, that was able to receive that Section 8 federal subsidy. Um, so we were able to double the subsidy we received. However, in that conversion, uh, it was that MMB determined then that these homes are now ineligible for POP Geo bonding. And we discovered that because two of the over 700 units that we converted had POP Geo uh, encumbrance on them. And so now we have two, randomly, uh, single family homes that exist on our Section 9 portfolio still because MMB would not let us convert them. Over uh, The rest of them are on the Section 8 portfolio. So despite being the same MPHA residents, served by the same MPHA staff, led by the same CEO and Board of Commissioners, MMB has determined that these homes are no longer eligible for POP Geo bonding. So, in fact, last session we came to you with a, a POP Geo cash, or excuse me, a POP cash request to clear this capital backlog, and it's actually precisely because of this issue that we came for that request. Um, so now, I can appreciate that MMB is trying to protect public bonding dollars. I fully appreciate that. But what gets lost in this conversation is that there are 3,100 people, over half of whom are children, currently living in these homes, which have an estimated capital backlog of $33 million in needs. Smarter people than me are going to tell you why uh, our wholly owned nonprofit does not perfectly fit the definition of publicly owned. But I'm here to tell you that what gets lost in that is every day that we go one word here, one word there in state statute is another day that we're not repairing a leaky roof. It's another day we're not repairing a drafty window. And it's another day we risk a decades old plumbing system, electric, electrical system failing, all because we can't access the pop geo bonding dollars the way the legislature intended last session. So I urge members of this committee today to support aligning federal best practices with existing state programs and ensure that the most economically vulnerable in the city of Minneapolis and around the state um, are able to be invested in the way this committee and this legislature intended when it passed 40 million in geo bonding. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, we'll hear from Jill Keppers. When you're ready, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair Port. Thank you, Vice Chair Bolden and committee members. My name is Jill Keppers. I'm the Executive Director of the Duluth Housing and Redevelopment Authority. I'm also the President of Minnesota NARO. And this is my first time testifying, so <laughs> if my voice is shaky, I apologize. <laughs> but I appreciate you letting me be part of the process. So in approximately 2014, the Duluth HRA started to move down a process to reposition some of its units from public housing to project-based vouchers. In repositioning, tenants that currently pay 30% of their income towards rent will continue to pay 30% of their income towards rent 
Repositioning is a business and legal process that helps us preserve our assets into the future. When the HRA was awarded what we call CHAPS, or Commitments to Enter into Housing Assistant Payments through HUD for a RAD conversion, and after incurring expenses uh, for capital needs assessments, uh, when we were originally told by Minnesota Housing that this was gonna be just fine, they said, uh, oops, I guess we forgot to check with MMB, and this isn't going to be okay after all. So the Duluth and HRA ended up having to return those CHAPS back to HUD and reassess how we were gonna do this moving forward. What kind of path could we find? So I'm not placing blame. Uh, this process is very complicated. And in my own opinion, they were right in the way that the HRA had originally intended to do a RAD conversion. But moving forward, we need to be able to find a path to help not only our large HRAs, but our smallest HRAs be able to do this. So I share this only to illustrate how many years we've been searching for a solution. This is year number eight. And we have a hearing today. So thank you for letting us have a public place to talk about it. We are truly only looking for acknowledgement that an LLC, which is wholly owned by an HRA with the same board, which is appointed by the mayor and approved by city council, be deemed public ownership. So as buildings reposition from public housing to section eight, the buildings may still access general obligation bonds. This does not expand the pie. It only keeps existing buildings eligible for this valuable resource. It does not cost the state any extra money. If an HRA brings on an investment partner for a tax credit rehab project, then they don't qualify for geo bonds any longer. That is clear. But with a wholly owned LLC, where the sole member is the HRA, this could work. If MMB is worried about the sale of an asset, wording can be added to the restricted, restrictive covenants that go with the loan that would allow this, or that wouldn't allow this. HRAs across the state have not utilized HUD's repositioning tools, and there are three, the Rental Assistance Demonstration, or RAD, Disposition, or Section 18, or the Streamlined Voluntary Conversion, Section 22, because they don't want to, one, risk not being eligible for GO bonds, and two, they don't have the capacity to start down this path with the risk of being rejected later. A case-by-case -case review by MMB has been suggested, but wouldn't a roadmap for success be easier? In Duluth, we've been able to convert 250 scattered sites through Section 18. We had to create Blue Water Housing LLC in order to do this. There was no pop money on those units. Also in Duluth, we converted two buildings totaling 387 units through RAD, or that rental assistance demonstration. This was a project-based rental assistance conversion with FHA debt. We had to create North Point Apartments LLC to do this, but there was no pop on those buildings either. In both cases, these LLCs became component units of the HRA and are included every year with our audit. Now we are converting four more buildings to RAD PBV, our project-based vouchers, 637 units. We could not move these to an LLC because these buildings do have pop and need to be owned directly by the HRA under MMB's current policy. We worked to find a workaround to do this. We still had to create an LLC, now Duluth RAD LLC, but instead of being the owner, this LLC will do nothing except sign the HAP contract. Doesn't that seem a little silly? <laughs> but that's what we have to do to get it done. We have to find a way to work within the law. After this conversion, we'll still have 150 public housing units left to reposition. 40 of those have POHP money on them. What kind of workaround am I gonna have to figure out to get that one done? Wouldn't a road map be nice? Wouldn't an acknowledgement that a wholly owned component unit of the HRA, such as a single member LLC, be a streamlined way to show small PHAs a path forward? We at Minnesota NARO are beyond thankful for general obligation bonds for publicly owned housing rehab. Our residents benefits when benefit when roofs don't leak, pipes don't disintegrate, and windows work as they should. 50-year-old buildings have lots of needs. And Minnesota's public housing authorities have done a good job serving their residents and providing quality housing. Now we need to be able to access those federal tools to keep up on the needs of aging properties. MMB has the opportunity to provide a roadmap to help, roadmap to help PHAs be successful in a conversion, preserve our affordable housing assets into the future, and most of all, keep people housed. The bill before you talks about public corporations, and I want to thank Chair Lee's team for looking into a solution. It is a great jumping off point, but I think we have the opportunity to simplify it to help our smallest PHAs access repositioning tools. 
Think of a wholly owned component unit single member LLC. You might think, well, Jill, you found a way to reposition these assets, so what's the problem? Well, now I currently have 637 units that are owned by our HRA's component units. When the cash RFP comes out from Minnesota Housing, we will apply for those units, uh, but what are the chances we'll see cash again? As agencies look to reposition, they don't want to jeopardize their opportunities for future rewards. They can't afford the risk. Minnesota Housing won't know how to handle an application that comes forward for geo bonds from one of our component units. MMB has said, well, you can sue us when you get rejected, and we'll let the courts decide. Is that a real solution? Aren't we all on the same side? Trying to help our most vulnerable residents, elderly, disabled, have quality housing that is safe and sanitary? Ms. Keppers, if you could conclude, yep, finish your thought, thank you. There has to be a way for clear guidance from MMB without a lawsuit. In summary, this is about preservation of affordable housing, about a tremendous resource the state brings forward with geo bonds for POP projects, and about accessing federal repositioning tools to partner with that resource. Uh, I believe a single member wholly owned LLC is that component unit of, that is a component unit of HRA is that roadmap forward. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And last, we will hear from Jen Hasmer. Please introduce yourself when you are ready and proceed. All right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon to members of the committee. For the record, I am Jen Hasmer, Assistant Commissioner for Debt Management at Minnesota Management and Budget. So thank you for this opportunity to make a brief comment on Senate File 4254. This is an issue that MNB has been engaged on for many years with both the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency and the Minnesota chapter of the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials. We look forward to being able to continue discussing the technical aspects of this bill. Unfortunately, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development did not design the Rental Assistance Demonstration, or RAD, program with Minnesota's Constitution in mind. And there are challenges in making the RAD program work for public housing authorities that have received state bond funds in the past and that may seek them again in the future. The Constitution requires that state bonds can only be appropriated for projects that are owned by state agencies or political subdivisions of the state. MMB's ongoing interest in this conversation will be protecting the validity of the state's bonds and ensuring the constitutional public ownership requirement continues to be met. We may not be able to find a solution for all cases of RAD, but are happy to continue discuss discussing what may be possible with all interested stakeholders. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, uh, Senator Port, anything to add before we move to questions? I think um, I just I appreciate Emma B being here and Naro and stakeholders. I'm hoping this is the beginning of a conversation that can get us to a solution. Uh, public housing is in dire need of reinvestment dollars, uh, and those are out there, uh, specifically federal money, um, and we need to find a way to open um, open that up that works with our constitution that works with all of the rules that are already in place. Um, I believe it's something that we can find a solution for. Thank you. Members, questions or discussion? Uh, Senator Draheim. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Senator Port, for bringing this forward. Um, so my understanding, most of this would be internal move from one entity to a non-profit LLC to get more funding from the federal government. Is that a correct uh, recap? Senator Port. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, Senator, uh, it, I would say yes, with the exception of it's not a non-profit LLC. It's still it's not a for-profit one either. I mean, it's still owned by the HRA, which is a political subdivision of the state. Senator Draham. Thank you. Um, and then, so I, I need more clarification on that. And then, uh, Senator Report, this um, really wouldn't be used to create more housing. It's just to help 
with existing inventory that's out there. Is that a correct assumption? I will, I will say, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, that this is certainly specifically to address that capital backlog. Um, that is where we are seeing a real need and um, a real sort of uh, roadblock. Um, but I do fear um, if we are willing to invest more money in building more public housing in the future, that knowing that this sort of problem exists down the road could make you know that sort of investment less likely. Senator Draham. Thank you. And, and then I'll pivot just a little bit on the uh, on the constitutional end of things. Um, you know, are, are, is there a chance this would end up in court? Have other states made changes like this? Um, what, I'll, what I'll say is we would like it to not. Um, I, we think there's a solution, or I think that there is a solution that can be found to clarify in the language of our statutes that an LLC that is created by a public housing authority and only exists with the public housing authority as the sole member is in reality, in practice, and I think we can find language, I hope we can find language in the law, the same as the public housing authority. And if those two things are the same, then they would still qualify under our constitution. In no way, shape, or form do I want or any of the advocates for this want this to open up an avenue for public money and geo bonds and investments in public housing to be going to non-public entities. That is not the goal of this. And we are very, very um, on board with MMB's role in protecting that. Um, that is a critical part of their job. Uh, and we fully support that. Senator Draham. Thank you. And, and then my last, I guess, question to you um, with your chair hat on is uh, what other stops do you see this bill making? Um, for sure it has to go to state and local. And then Davin's going to tell me if it has to go anywhere else. Just state and local. <laughs> okay, thank Senator you. Senator Draham. All right, members, any other questions or discussion? Right. Uh, seeing none, uh, Senator Muhammad, would you like to make a motion to move the bill um, as amended to be recommended to pass and referred to the Committee on State and Local Government? Thank you. Um, all those, that being the motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Aye. Uh, the motion prevails. Uh, Senate File 4254 as amended is recommended to pass and re referred to the Committee on State and Local Government. Our next bill will be uh, Senator Hosschild's bill, Senate File 3768, and I will hand the gavel back to Chair Port. Senator Hosschild, welcome to the committee. Uh, please introduce yourself and present Senate File 3768. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Housing Committee. Um, today I have for your consideration Senate File 3758, a bill that modifies the Greater Minnesota Housing Infrastructure Program and provides funding to support this program. The Greater Minnesota Housing Infrastructure Program was established in 2023 Housing Omnibus Bill, and it allows the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency to provide grants to cities outside the jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Council to cover up to 50% of the capital costs of public infrastructure for workforce housing developments. Funding is eligible for single and multifamily housing developments. Um, as you've heard me say many, many times, I represent the largest and most rural district in Minnesota, 
And as I travel around my region, I continue to hear more and more from folks that want to live in greater Minnesota, but especially, I would argue, uh, up in northern Minnesota where we have some beautiful lakes and places that folks want to live. And unfortunately, there quite literally is not the housing for folks to afford to live in those communities with the jobs that they are offered. So this is a, a sincere challenge to many of our greater Minnesota communities. Um, rural communities are also often the last to receive state support given the unique challenges that we face with our property tax base and opportunities for investments. Um, we also face some really unique challenges with just the price of the construction of housing uh, in greater Minnesota and in particular with the hard rock in northern Minnesota. So this would help us address those additional challenges that we face in our rural communities. Um, the other factor that we face is I hear continually from existing businesses in greater Minnesota, but also businesses that would like to open up in greater Minnesota that are unable to do so because they don't have the housing available for their employees. And so I've brought two testifiers with me, Madam Chair and members, uh, one from sort of an employer perspective in northern Minnesota and another from a very remote rural community uh, public housing perspective. And I would love for them to testify alongside um, uh, Scott, so I will let them testify and hear for questions uh, as you need me. Thank you, Senator Hosschild. Uh, and for the record, a quorum is present. Um, Mr. McMahon, please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Uh, Chair Port, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of this bill. Uh, my name is Scott McMahon with the law firm uh, Flirt and Hood here on behalf of the Greater Minnesota Partnership. Uh, we are supporting this bill for a number of reasons, and I want to draw your attention to uh, this report that's in your packet that uh, helps quantify the market realities that we face building housing in greater Minnesota. So in a typical functioning market, you have your production costs, and then you hope that end of the day that the value the market places on whatever you're producing is higher than what it costs to produce. That's not the case that we face in communities across greater Minnesota. Uh, on the housing front, if you build a, a house and it costs $300,000 to produce, a lot of times the market's gonna say that that house is actually worth $225,000, just as an example. Um, you all heard testimony last year from uh, Skip Chanel from DW Jones and Mayor Fabian from Roseau about a project that they did in Roseau that opened in, in uh, July of 22 where a 37 unit apartment building cost uh, $6.5 million to build and it appraised for $4 million when it was done. There's another project happening right now in central Minnesota, uh, 50 units, $9 million to produce, it'll appraise for $6 million when it's done. Uh, there's a project chair that you heard about when you were doing your tours on in Jackson, it's a three phase, uh, 200 unit uh, workforce housing development uh, they were able to get the financing done for phase one and they used every tool that they have in the community to get phase one done and they don't have financing for phase two and phase three for housing that they need in that community. So what this bill does is it provides more funding for yet another tool that we have uh, for developing housing in greater Minnesota. One of the things that we know is that the market failure begins, it doesn't end, but it begins with the public infrastructure. Uh, I was just talking with, with one of our communities and it's, it's, they're working on a project right now to build out the infrastructure for some single family homes. Uh, they anticipate that cost to be about $80,000 to do that lot. And it's gonna value at about $17,000 when it's done. So that's a $63,000 gap that we're facing. So that's really where our market failure truly begins. Uh, this bill, this program, as I said, puts another tool in the toolbox. And one of the things you hear from developers across greater Minnesota is to close that gap it requires stacking. What that means is you put a, a number of different tools in place to, to make it happen. It can be uh, tax increment financing, it can be tax abatement, it can be waiving of hookup fees, it can be financing like the Minnesota, uh, the Greater Minnesota Ho uh, Workforce Housing Grant Program. It can be this. But what we need in Greater Minnesota to make these things happen is a multitude of tools that we can cobble together to close that gap to make things happen. So this won't be the end all be all to the solving housing in greater Minnesota, but it will be one more tool that our communities can use to build the housing that we need 
to grow our economy, to supply the workers that our workforce needs, uh, and to make our communities thrive. So thank you, uh, Senator Hochschild, for carrying this bill. Uh, I do want to highlight that it, it is a bipartisan bill. Uh, we've got members uh, from both sides uh, that are supporting this, and I'm happy to answer any questions, and we've got some other great testifiers as well. Thank you very much, Mr. McMahon. Uh, the next testifier on my list is joining us virtually, Jason Hale. Mr. Hale, if you could uh, unmute yourself and introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay, great, sorry, I couldn't see any thumbs up there. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair and Committee, for the opportunity to speak with you about uh, Senate File 3768. Uh, and my thanks especially to Senator Hochschild and Greater Minnesota Partnership for facilitating this really important conversation. Again, my name is Jason Hale. I am the Executive Director of the Cook County HRA, and I am sorry I can't be with you in person today. Um, I have had the privilege of working for local government on real estate and housing development for 10 years uh, in this great state. Uh, in that time, I have watched construction costs steadily increase every year, hoping and thinking that uh, this is the last year it will come back down uh, and as you probably can guess, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, unfortunately, uh, on top of the costs, we're also dealing with a high interest rate environment and building the housing we need now has never been more expensive nor more challenging. For those of you unfamiliar with the North Shore in Cook County, uh, we are the northeasternmost county in the state uh, with Lake Superior to our east, Canada to the north, of course, uh, the Boundary Waters and National Forests to our west. We are essentially Minnesota's outdoor playground. Uh, where a population of 5,600 people hosts uh, almost a million and a half visitors every year. We are also the last 50 feet of the last mile of distribution. And like most communities across the state, we have a housing problem. Uh, in fact, Cook County has the least affordable housing in the state of Minnesota. The median sale price of homes is about five and a half times the median household income. As of noon today, I just checked, there, uh, there's one single family house available within 30 miles of Grand Marais for under $500,000. The median household income is $77,000. So our housing challenge in rural Minnesota, it's not unique, it is a little different. The fertile uh, acres of Southern Minnesota where I grew up provide a lot of room for construction, but often that's at the expense of productive farmland and limited utilities. The homes uh, on the Iron Range uh, or in Silver Bay, for example, may seem like a bargain to the seven county metro residents, but as Scott already alluded to, building new entry level homes often doesn't pencil. Uh, they simply have fewer resources, both financial and with regard to skilled workers, which often frankly makes the math impossible to solve. I don't think any of your esteemed committee uh, is surprised to hear that housing is a problem and building it is expensive. Um, that's Finally, a pretty well-established and accepted fact. Cook County, however, is a little special because everything is just a little bit harder. For example, there is no natural gas in Cook County. Silver Bay, which is in Lake County, uh, is the end of the line for natural gas. Grand Marais, which is the only city in Cook County, is an hour north of that. Consequently, it's the only location in Cook County with access to public utilities. While Cook County is larger than Rhode Island, less than 1% of that area offers public utilities. Still, in housing development, we go where the problem uh, is and we go where the opportunity is. The Cook County HRA is working on several multifamily projects in the city of Grand Bray. Of course, we need housing across the county, uh, but building one house without utilities anywhere outside of the city limits means about $60,000 out the gate for utilities in the driveway. That's not including the cost of the land and that's before you put any foundation in. Even within city limits, the cost of infrastructure can be astounding. Uh, again, Scott had already alluded to this, but for example, a local nonprofit is trying to build houses for income qualified families and sell them at $250,000 or less. That's the goal. Uh, there are two properties that they acquired last year, but those properties and that project is on hold because they have to extend the public utilities 150 feet, uh, which comes out to about $80,000. We are working with them at DHRA to help minimize these costs and try and get creative, but frankly, small rural communities have a limited resource and the infrastructure in Grand Marais serves, like I said before, uh, over a million people a year, while 1,340 city residents have to maintain that infrastructure. We all know that local governments have limited tools in our toolbox. Uh, and while we had an incredible year last year, uh, thank you to the legislature, uh, many rural communities still struggle to access those important new funds. Really, we don't always have the types of projects those funds are designed for. 
Uh, it is harder to get developers interested and able to build in our communities, and our projects often, frankly, cost more than they cost in Minneapolis because of economies of scale, logistics, a whole litany of reasons. Infrastructure is one thing that every project needs. I don't care what kind it is or where it is. You have to have utilities. So the additional $20 million proposed in this bill will not solve the problem. It won't. But in my opinion, this is an all hands on deck moment for housing in Minnesota and Senate file 3768 will help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hale. And finally, Dante Tomasoni. Mr. Tomasoni, please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Thank you, Chair Port. Uh, Dante Tomasoni, I am the Director of Corporate Affairs at Cirrus Aircraft. Uh, thank you, members, for having me today, uh, and Chair Port. Um, at, uh, at Cirrus um, Aircraft, we employ 1,500 people in the city of Duluth. Um, and we are the number one builder of general aviation aircraft in the world. Um, we are, if we could hire tomorrow, we'd hire 250 people to help our facilities. Um, in the last three years, we have had 35 job rejections because of housing in the Duluth area. Uh, that includes people that have accepted a job, a position, and then tried to find housing and then couldn't or simply waited to accept the job until they found out they couldn't find housing. Um, we are having trouble growing. We are having trouble meeting the needs of our company um, because of the housing constraint. Um, as you heard from both of our two uh, previous testifiers, um, the, housing, the housing crunch is difficult for a number of reasons. Prior to my job at Cirrus, um, prior to my job at Cirrus, I, I spent time as a multifamily developer. And, um, and Jason touched on it as well as Scott. Uh, the, we're in this state that I don't think that we've seen before in Minnesota where I, I've, I've kind of monikered it, the three rocks in a hard place. Um, the cost of construction is, is as record highs. Um, cost of money, so interest rates are really high. And most communities have already pushed rents and the cost of homes as far as people can handle. Um, we're actually getting to the point where we're seeing, we're now seeing um, the fill up, buildings fill up much slower because the, uh, the community cannot afford the rents of new market rate places. And so we need uh, the, the final, the, those are the three rocks, the final hard place is the state needs housing. Um, and how do we get it? We need supply. Um, and there are tools that the state has that can help the state along those lines. And this Senate file is one of those bills that can do it. Um, when a developer looks at a project, I think it's important to remember, and I, I, I got a, a, a pretty good insight to this when we were building multifamily, everything is math. Um, it really is. And developers, um, you know, against some people's view of property developers, they aren't these big piles of cash that are just like, ready to throw numbers at things. They borrow from the banks just like the rest of us. They have to make numbers work just like the rest of us. Um, they have to show that the rent can justify the cost to construct, otherwise it's not gonna happen. And that happens on a single family scale, it happens on a multi-family scale, it happens with townhomes, it happens with everything. And so um, because of the unique situation we're in across the state and frankly across the country, um, it, it's it, a bill like this, in fact, I think uh, I, I, would, I would advocate for even more bills that go further um, to help the housing crunch in this state to clear those financial gaps, to make it possible for developers to build because we need housing and without a way to make the financials work on a housing, we're not gonna get it. And that is why I testify and, and, and thank you all for having me today. Thank you very much, Mr. Tomasoni. Uh, members, questions? Senator uh, Housley. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Hochschild and testifiers. Uh, I guess this goes back to the a bill, a couple of bills back, um, and the word that nobody here said either was the word profit, but it was said indirectly that the builders hope the value after construction is greater than the cost to build. And like uh, I almost said Senator Thomasoni. <laughs> We miss him, we miss your dad, but <laughs> good to see you, Dante. Um, but like you said, these developers uh, aren't making boatloads of cash. You're, you're trying to figure out ways to make ends meet because you do want to build more affordable housing for folks, but you also have to make it make sense for the developer to want to develop those, those uh, buildings. So I wanna thank you for uh, bringing this bill forward because we, we do need more buildings to be built, so thank you. 
Senator Mohammed. Thank you, Chair Port. I just have a few questions. One is we're changing uh, the maximum amount of grants that cities can receive from 30 to 40,000. It sounds like, why is that? Senator Hauschild. I'm gonna pass that one to Mr. McMahon. Mr. McMahon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chair Report, Senator. Um, so we put this, this program together last year and we had a general sense as to where the market was and we've gotten more information since then. So the underlying program right now, uh, the maximum grant for the public infrastructure for a single family under state statute is $30,000. So that assumes an equal amount matching grant from the local community for a $60,000 project. Uh, we've learned that the public infrastructure cost for a typical uh, single family lot is about $80,000. Um, there's also in, in statute a different provision for multifamily. So the single family is a single family through a, a fourplex. Uh, for a multifamily, uh, the maximum grant is $180,000. So assuming $360,000 with a local 50-50 match. So we're just bringing uh, that single family number up to what we're seeing as the actual market rate uh, in current reality. Senator Mohammed. Thank you. And then um, I know that the Greater Minnesota Housing Infrastructure Grant was created last year and we put $5 million one-time money. How much of that is left and how much of that will be coming out to cover some of this? Senator, uh, Mr. McMahon. Uh, Senator Porter, uh, Senator, uh, so the funding that was approved last year is still in place. Uh, MHFA, as you know, has a number of new programs that they're working through. Uh, this one hasn't gotten launched yet. Uh, but I can tell you from outreach that we have received, uh, we spent the money that was appropriated just off of interest in about 10 minutes <laughs> after we hit send on the email to Greater Minnesota saying that these dollars are available. Uh, the demand is high. Uh, the need uh, to support our economic development in Greater Minnesota is there. Uh, and so we're just kind of looking at the fact of of this being a program that, be, that can be funded through the bonding bill or appropriations. With this being a bonding session, we want to get this before the bonding committee for consideration as they put their uh, their capital investment bill together. Thank you. Senator Mohammed. Thank you, Chair Port, and thank you, Senator Hostry, for bringing this forward. I think it's so clear that there's a huge need across the state, um, definitely in your area, that we need to build more housing, which is often why I speak so much about the idea of ha us actually creating dedicated funding for housing because the need is that great. And so I want to thank you for bringing this forward. Senator Lucero. Could I, Madam Chair, would you mind if I responded to that just very briefly? Senator Sorry about that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Mohammed. I just want to say uh, Senator Mohammed represents Minneapolis, as we all know, and I represent uh, a very rural district. Senator Mohammed took the opportunity to come with me uh, to the North Shore near where Mr. Hale uh, operates and works to try to provide housing. She saw firsthand uh, this need herself, and I just appreciate the fact that we realize that urban, suburban, rural, we are all facing a tremendous housing uh, crisis, and this bill is a drop in the bucket. So anything we can do in this bonding bill to, or an appropriation is going to make a big difference. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Senator Hauschild. Homeownership uh, and the number of units in this state is definitely a serious issue, as we've been discussing for a number of years, uh, certainly in this committee. So Mr. McMahon mentioned the comment that uh, Senator Hous Housley already referenced, by that, and that is the, the comment that builders need to have the value exceed the cost of construction. And then uh, Mr. Tomasoni made the comment that the, to make the financials work. So Madam Chair, my question for Mr. Tomasoni, could you just expand, what do you mean when you say make the financials work? Mr. Tomasoni. Thank you, Chair Port, Senator Lucero. Um, to make the numbers work, um, I, can I, I'll use a multifamily um, uh, example. Um, so when the, the quickest way to say it is in a multifamily project, you can anticipate your rents that you can get in a community from similar rents, right? So you take the rent per unit times the amount of units, and then essentially you have to decide what is the cost to construct. Um, and then you bring that 
to your bank and your bank will say, all right, we will lend you 60% of that entire cost to construct. Um, during uh, easier financial times, it was actually 80% they would lend. So then you have to come up with, then you have to come up with a down payment, which is 40% of it, which is so many millions of dollars. And be, while the bank is doing that assessment, the bank will then appraise the building, look at your business plan and make sure your rents cover a certain gap above, over and above what the actual cost to construct is. And so it's usually 1.25 times. Um, and so that is the only way the bank will lend. And so your numbers on the profit have to exceed the cost to construct uh, by a certain number. Otherwise, there's no funding for the project. It just won't happen. And on a single family project, it's, it's a similar thing. Um, and, and especially since the state has gotten away from most, a lot of communities in greater Minnesota have gotten away from putting in curb gutter roads, sidewalks, et cetera. Now you have to put in, a developer has to put in new curb, new, new sidewalks, and you're in three, four, five million dollars before you even move dirt on one of your lots. And so then you have to, then you have to take the math on what you think you can sell those lots for, um, and then take the risk that you're going to make money on usually the last three or four lots of a whole development. And so um, all that math is done up front, and if it, doesn't, if it doesn't do it, it doesn't make sense, the bank doesn't lend, and the investment doesn't happen. Senator Lucero. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Tomasoni, for, for highlighting that detail. So you, uh, in your description here, you described how the bank is looking for uh, a covering of that gap mm -hmm. of what the cost is and going above and beyond. So a certain percentage, I know some financial institutions want 10% over, 25% uh, over, so 125%. The income generally, I, I know it's a rule of thumb of financial institutions to be 125%. Mm -hmm. So would it be fair then to say that that gap, as you said, or that 125%, anything over 100% of the cost, it, would it be fair to characterize that as profit? Mr. Tomasoni. Um, uh, Chair Port, uh, Senator Lucero, yes, I, I think it'd be fair to, 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 to anything over 100% would be characterized as profit, but if you don't meet the bank's minimum at 125% or 1.25, the project, the bank won't lend, so you won't have it, right? So it, it won't, you'll, you won't even have a project usually. So that's kind of tricky how to characterize it. Senator Lucer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. And so then, Senator Hostchild, again, I, I appreciate this because uh, obviously, uh, as a realtor, as somebody uh, very much interested in the, the uh, real estate space, I, I firmly believe the more homes, the better, for sure. Mm -hmm. And so again, I appreciate this. So if I understand your bill correctly then, and as I've understood the testifiers, would it be fair for me, uh, is, my, is the statement that the lack of profit or the fact that costs are exceeding the fair market value, that that is acting as a force for the lack of construction and therefore the lack of supply in these rural parts of Minnesota? Senator Hostchild. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Lucero, yes, uh, I think what you're saying is, is absolutely correct. And I would just add that I think what you're getting at here and what I'm kind of highlighting by bringing this bill forward is that in our rural communities especially, we face additional costs that go into the construction of these facilities, given a lot of what the testimony Mr. Hale was, was commenting on, the distance, the lack of utilities, the isolation, all of those factors. The lack of workforce, huge issue. So lots of different factors challenging rural communities. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair. And yeah, I, and I concur. There are certainly additional costs that are experienced or may make it more expensive in rural Minnesota than a similar project might cost or would be in uh, closer to the metro, for, absolutely for sure. But there is the reality that where the cost exceeds the value, regardless of where that is, it acts as a force to disincentivize the construction or the furtherance of supply in that type of housing product. And that's the reality. And when it comes to developers, there is incredible risk involved. Even aside from the conversation that, uh, that we were just having, because a developer who has a track of land, who has a potential vision, has to number one, go through the time and energy and money of potentially acquiring that land, and then has to go through the time, energy, and expense 
of the development phase, or I should say the, the uh, design phases, uh, rather, and that design phase and process could involve a series of uh, city councils, public uh, uh, commission or planning commission meetings, et cetera, and that could take a lot of time. And there's holding costs involved. And this, during this phase, or during this process, the developer has to guesstimate. There's a lot of guesstimating work involved, projecting what the final cost would be, projecting what the value might be, and then in the course of 12, 18, 24 months, other externalities like a market downturn, like other forces could severely impact. And so there's an incredible amount of risk. And so, again, I, it just, it's something to highlight on this bill and in other bills, and I'm speaking more broadly here, other bills that this committee has heard, even today, that we need to have a reality check in those bills that where there isn't an option to make money, that force acts as a disincentive and it actually decreases supply. All the hyperbole, all the words of demonizing, and what was the word I think I heard earlier today, uh, predatory rent increases or price increases. Right? All that rhetoric aside, the reality is if policy and hardship make it impossible to make a profit and or to assume the risk, financial institution or developer aside, that is not good for the future of Minnesota. So again, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Hauschild, because I th believe this bill is definitely uh, important for all of Minnesota because we need to uh, continue to build that supply. Thank you so much. Senator Draheim. Thank you, Chair Port. And, and thank you for bringing this bill forward. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I've worked on forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, Senator Mohammed, the uh, original bill I had was $15,000 per lot. And that was because the cost, the inf infrastructure was around 30000 at that time. Um, and of course, costs continue to go up and up and up. Um, I, I, I do have a little concern of raising that dollar amount in a time period where we haven't even had the program up and running. And I know infrastructure is increasing, um, but if we have the demand that it sounds like we will have when the agency gets it done um, sometime in the future, um, you know, maybe we should keep it at 30 to a time period and then raise it um, to get more communities to use it so we get more growth and uh, more units built. Uh, just something to think about. Um, and then the debt service, I assume we'll look at. Is this coming back? This bill's going to capital investment and it is their debt service to worry Perfect. about. <laughs> Perfect, okay, I will uh, ask uh, later then. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Hauschild, did you have anything? Um, Senator Hauschild, I want to thank you for bringing this bill. I'm proud to be a co-author on it. Um, I really, uh, when we toured the state, both northern Minnesota and southern Minnesota, uh, the housing needs are different in so many communities. But there was one word we heard over and over and over and over in pretty much every community, and it was infrastructure. It was the cost of infrastructure and how difficult it was to bridge that gap and to bring developers in. Um, I'm delighted to, to move this bill forward. I think it's a great program. I can't wait for it to become uh, a center point of housing policy in Minnesota because I think it, uh, f it fills the... Um, what I think is the spirit of all of the communities that we visited that are, they're ready to grow. Um, they're ready, they have thriving businesses that want to expand, they have opportunities to grow, um, and it is time that we do our part to help them do that. Um, so with that, um, I, Senator Bolden moves that, hang on, I have my, uh, that 3768 is recommended to pass and refer to the Committee on Capital Investment. All in favor say aye. 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 
Your bill, are opposed? Right. Your bill is on the way. Thank you, uh, Senator Hochschild. Members, if you could stick around for just one minute after committee, I wanna just update you on something. Uh, we will meet both Tuesday and Thursday next week. And with that, we are at the end of our agenda. And with no other business, we are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>